Good morning. Thank you for being here with us today. As a director of our Employee Benefit Plan Assurance Group, we do over 300 audits on an annual basis. And for the past couple of years, we've been discussing at a high level with our clients the importance of addressing cybersecurity with regard to the plan activities. And that's why we have Jeff here today to get into some of the more details of cybersecurity with regard to your employee benefit plan audits. Cybersecurity impacts us in every aspect of our life. Um, with retirement plans, it's where all the money is. So naturally, it's going to be uh, attacked from the cybersecurity area. Um, what's important to note is you can't prevent cyber attacks, but you can protect. So today, what we're going to go through is some live examples of client attacks that we've had. We're going to talk about some of the national attacks. We're going to talk about some of the a variety of threats facing plans, as well as methods for protecting our plans. We're going to go through some of the recommendations of the ERISA Advisory Council report, talk about data protection, and then we're going to wrap up with best practices and action items for protecting the plans, and we'll have some time for questions at the end. As part of our best practices for the employee benefit plan areas, we've been talking to our clients over the past few years talking about making sure that they ensure that their cyber risk assessments and or cyber insurance policies cover their plan activity, including vendors. But until this past spring, we we're not aware of any attacks. So the first two situations that were identified to us during our audits in June of 2017, what's important to note about these issues is that they were identified by the clients. They were not as a result of our audit. I also want to highlight that all plans are at risk, regardless of your size, regardless of whether you have an audit or you don't have an audit. In both the situations we had, only the accounts of key management were attacked. Information on the key leaders of an organization is readily available on the websites. So the focus of the attacks was on six to 10 highly compensated individuals. They were looking for the larger account balances. In one case, the attackers attempted to take loans, the other distributions. Both cases, they were phishing attempts using personal data. In each of the cases, the sponsor and the provider invest, performed investigations. Those investigations determined that there were no breaches of personal identifiable information. So again, the information came from data that was obtained elsewhere, but used to attack these two different plans. In each of the cases, it was the internal controls at the sponsor or company level and the internal controls at the provider or vendor or custodial level that prevented the funds from leaving the plan. So when you want, when you want to take a distribution or take a loan, there's usually an email verification or a letter verification. One of the HCs got these letters, said, I didn't authorize that loan, and that started the ball rolling. On the distribution side and the provider side, there's also verification of that personal identifiable information, and that information didn't line up, so it prevented the distributions from leaving the plan. Both of these situations highlight the importance of not circumventing your controls and making sure you have the appropriate controls in place. Another key thing with this, none of these situations are public knowledge. There were several individuals involved. Those individuals were notified and their accounts were locked, but this wasn't something you read about in the paper. This is going on throughout the country with regard to all of our plans. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff, our expert in the field, uh, to talk about what happens when the funds actually did leave the field, did leave the plan. Thank you, Janet. So I, I think what we're what we're starting to see is a recognition by the hackers that um, employee benefit plans have significant funds in them, and we're starting to see. And I would say it's fairly recent. Recent, you know, being as as the screen indicates, you know, the, this past um, or a year ago, this past July and, and June, that we see really some of the first true hacking events that have occurred. Um, the very first one on the screen, July 2016, um, 
basically it was a ransomware attack and there was uh, the breach exposed personal data of 18,000 participants. Um, the reason that they didn't have to pay, uh, they were supposed to pay in, in three Bitcoins and that for some of you who don't know what a Bitcoin is, it's a financial instrument. Um, three Bitcoins, <coughs> excuse me, is related to about $2,000. Um, they had good backup and because they had good backup, um, they didn't have to pay the ransom. I think the bigger one in my mind is the June 2016 with the municipal employees in Chicago. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. As you can see, hackers actually did access or obtain personal information. Uh, they created web profiles and re and actually withdrew um, approximately $2.5 million from retirement accounts. Um, the city was kind enough as the plan sponsor to return the funds that were breached. But in the end, you know, $2.5 million was lost. Um, the last um, bullet point on, on the screen has to do with um, the federal agency, Health and Human Services, this has to do with a HIPAA violation and, and monies associated with it. And, and the reason I put that in there is that, you know, we have a lot of um, protected information, PI. <clears throat> and as a result of that, a lot of that PI is really EPHI. And what we need to do is protect it and make sure that um, we don't expose it and if it does get exposed, there are true fines that can happen as a result of that. What I thought would be interesting is, you know, let's talk about some of the statistics. Um, one of the statistics is, you know, 10 phishing email leads to a 90% chance of at least one person clicking on, you know, a ma malicious link. Um, Phishing is certainly a way, and we'll talk about it in more detail in a bit. Um, phishing is a way that a lot of people are being attacked. I would imagine that most of you, uh, if not all of you, have had some type of uh, phishing situation um, occur. Um, board members. Board members are, are really looking to understand what their um, board that they're working at um, uh, they're really looking to uh, understand the cybersecurity practices of the organization. And the, the end result is um, board members are starting to push and, and actually demand that cybersecurity is discussed and cybersecurity, uh, a roadmap and a plan for the organization that they represent is, is in place because they don't want to be on the hook they don't want to be exposed to everything that goes on as it relates to, to cybersecurity. Um, there's 1.5 million pieces of malware, and quite frankly, I think it's probably up to 2 million pieces of malware that are released every day. So, you know, things, food for thought. We, we have to be very careful. Um, a lot of people think that um, hackers will go into a system, get the information, and go out. And that, that actually is not how it works. Once a hacker is in a system, they're there to extract as much information. And on average, um, they're there for, you know, as the slide indicates, about 150 days. We've been working with the state's uh, state of Connecticut attorney general's office. We're, we're privy to some um, confidential information. But what I can share for you is that there have been a number of those high profile cases, uh, attacks, that they've been in there for multiple years. And so it's not quick in and out, it's go in and stay there for as long as possible. And lastly, I think you know what we've been seeing is most organizations are not prepared for a cybersecurity incident or attack. Um, attackers are well organized. Technically, they're very, they, they tend to be very advanced, although some of the attacks that I've seen, quite frankly, um, it was a lack of preparation on the business side. Uh, it wasn't overly technical. Phishing was uh, 
certainly played a role in, in many of these attacks. Um, and I shared with you earlier the, the, the new view. It's, it's not quick in and exit. It's go in, stay hidden, look at and go through the entire network, through the virtual walls that exist, and um, be stealthy and stay there until you get caught, essentially. So why are employee plans at risk? Well, quite frankly, one of the biggest reasons is they have a lot of key information that everyone wants. And the reason they want it is um, hackers, attackers, can sell that information on the open market for a lot of money. Um, so we need to be vigilant in how we store information. The other thing about employee benefit plans is we, we're sharing PI information, personal information, with a number of third parties. We're, we're providing it with um, uh, the providers. We're providing it to the TPAs. Businesses have this benefit information stored electronically on premise. So it's sitting there. It's, it's around a lot. And we need to be very careful of who has access to it, how we store it, and um, I think some of those things also um, flow into how are we protecting it. And, and what I wanted to share with you is that um, certainly the, the state of Connecticut, if you don't know it, um, as well as I'm going to say 48% or 48 states have data breach laws in place. So the state of Connecticut um, has privacy laws, um, the state of Massachusetts who actually started uh, and, and actually has a very good privacy law. It's called CMR 17.00. Um, Connecticut adopted a, a new law in, in July of 2015 related to privacy. If you're interested, it's Public Act 15-142. Um, but basically, it's an act to improve data security um, within the state and it, it actually amends the state's data breach notification law and requires anyone who has been affected by a breach, you actually have to contact the state of uh, Connecticut's attorney general within 90 days of the security breach. So I, I guess my point here is that there are a lot of mechanisms in place at the state level um, that you need to be aware of as it relates to personal information and um, any type of breaches related to um, PI. Um, there are some at the federal level. Certainly HIPAA is one that we talked about earlier. And the um, federal agency, Health and Human Services, also needs to be contacted if um, EPHI, which is an electronic um, health care information, uh, personal health information, uh, is what it stands for, um, it is actually exposed. So we need to be very careful about it and, and understand the impact of it and the impact to every organization. What I wanted to share with you is uh, a report that the ERISA Advisory Council came out with in, in 2016. And basically, the ERISA Advisory Council examined uh, cybersecurity um, and they wanted to come up with some guidelines or at least assess the impact of cybersecurity uh, as it relates to uh, employee welfare and, and benefit plans. And then um, essentially um, take a position as to what people should be thinking about and considering. Um, as part of uh, the ERISA Advisory Council, and, and there is an actual report out there, um, Basically, what they're suggesting everyone do is develop a cybersecurity strategy and program. Um, they're not very prescriptive in what they, how they recommend it, and there is nothing that mandates anyone to have it in place. But certainly, it's um, good business practice, or it's becoming a good business practice, to uh, develop a cybersecurity strategy and program. Um, I wouldn't say uh, just for employee benefit plans. I think it really needs to be for the entire organization. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, and, and what we're seeing and talking about with folks is um, having a thought out cybersecurity strategy and program 
will help protect your business, will help protect your employees. Certainly TPAs and providers will be protected as well. And I think, Jeff, from that Aversa Advisory Council report, what they found was that a lot of companies do have cyber strategies and risk assessments, but the plan is not encompassed in those policies and procedures. So it's important to make sure you're considering all aspects of the plan. Correct. Yeah, no, no doubt. Um, the, the strategy that they that they suggested talked about implementing um, and, you know, how is an organization organization going to implement and, my, uh, and monitor cybersecurity practices, um, how they're going to be testing and updating um, software and, and other cybersecurity protocols and practices. What does their reporting um, look like? Um, the, the one that should have stars all around it is the, the, the topic of training. I, I personally believe that we need to do a much better job about training our people, and we'll get into more details in a little bit. Um, how do we control access to PII, um, data retention and destruction? What is our policy, and, and how do we destroy PII? And then certainly third-party risk management. Um, not all third-party, um, not all uh, TPAs are alike. You know, what do the TPAs do? to protect the data, what kind of protocols and policies do they have in-house that, that help to protect us? Um, basically, what ERISA was, was trying to do in this report is to say, look, you, you really need to come up with a game plan. Um, they also recommended um, there's an organization, it's quasi-federal organization called NIST. NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And essentially, NIST has come up with a cybersecurity framework. And in the ERISA Advisory Council report, they actually talk about NIST um, and talk about elements of the, the cybersecurity framework that NIST provides. This is all free, and you can go online. And I wish I had the exact um, website to go to, but I believe it's uh, uh, NIST.org and you can find and, and type in the cybersecurity framework and you certainly can get a lot more information on that. I think that the, the purpose of our kind of planting the stake in the ground as far as this ERISA Advisory Council report is that it's really the first time that they've made a stand so significantly about cybersecurity and how we really need to be protecting um, our information. So speaking about information, you know, what are the attackers looking for? They're looking for, you know, any type of personal data, uh, employee data, social security number, insurance information, date of birth, um, any type of financial information, and, and let's not forget credentials. You know, if they can get user IDs and passwords from people, um, they can actually, you um, uh, get a lot of good information. They can use that information to get into other systems. And to be quite frank, um, a lot of us use the same user ID and passwords for one system to the next. So once they've harvested credentials, I guarantee you they will do their best to go out to a provider site or a TPA site and, and attempt to use those credentials and actually access um, you know, the, the information uh, on each one of those respective sites. And so, you know, we just need to understand that we need to protect it. We need to um, look at ways to protecting it and ensuring that what whatever we can do, and I look at it as best practice, is they want this data. We need to try to figure out a way to, to contain it and limit access as well. I'm going to jump to a slide. I know we've all heard about the Equifax situation. Um, uh, Equifax was uh, breached um, back in uh, mid-May through July of this past year. Um, I, I should have updated the slide. I believe that it's not 143 million Americans. It's now up to 145.5 million Americans. The reason I brought up this slide is there's two pieces of information that in my mind, um, was exposed and, quite frankly, um, is, is of concern to me anyway. 
Um, and actually, I'm going to make it three pieces of information. One is social security number. The second is date of birth. And the third is a driver's license number. But let's deal with the first two in particular. Um, the reason I'm bringing it up and, and making such an emphasis here is that these are two pieces of information that never change. Your date of birth, although some of us would like our date of birth to change, uh, our date of birth really never changes and it's fixed. The same thing is true with our social security number. And I'm bringing this up for discussion because, you know, the breach happened mid-May and, and between us, I will go on on a limb and say, you know, they were in their systems well before mid-May. They, they were looking through their systems um, uh, I would imagine six months before then. This is, uh, I don't know anything that you don't know, um, but I can't imagine how they could get 145 million American information, the information from 145 million Americans in, you know, a short period of time without being discovered in a significant way. So, but my point on this is because their social security number and date of birth doesn't change, you know, the impact of this breach is not this year, next year, or even five years from now, it's forever. And so that's what bothers me the most. And when you think about it, you know, although driver license numbers don't change with a lot of frequency, um, it's pretty much in the same boat. Uh, you know, I've had a Connecticut driver's license for the past, I don't know, um, uh, I won't get yeah, too many years, <laughs> but, you know, at the end of the day, it's the same number. And, and I think we just need to understand that and respect it. Um, I know that Equifax has basically said, you know, we will um, give you identity theft protection for, I believe now it's it's up to two years. But, but quite frankly, that's a drop in the bucket. And, you know, we need to be very acute as to how we're going to secure our information. What I thought would be interesting is, uh, you know, just a, a quick diagram of, you know, who has this information. Um, businesses have the information. TPAs, third-party administrators, have this information. Certainly, providers have the information. Information is coming from the employee, and we're sending information, you know, all around the employee to the business, sometimes to to the provider and third-party administrator, um, the business certainly to the third party administrator and provider. And so we, we've kind of got this, this loop going on. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we want to have some understanding of how certainly the provider and TPA third party administrator um, is securing our information. You'll notice uh, on the bottom of each one of the, the provider um, uh, uh, square, or rectangle and, and TPA square, there's there's uh, stars, something called a SOC 1 and a SOC 2. So what I thought I'd do is just spend a, a few minutes in, in explaining what a SOC 2 or and, and SOC 1 is and why I believe it's important for the provider, um, certainly the provider, um, and in certain situations, the TPA, to have an outside independent audit to validate the security um, and privacy and controls that they put into place to protect our personal information. So just a little bit about a, a SOC 1 and a SOC 2. Um, both are um, standards that are set by the AICPA. Um, it's an independent audit, so it's not someone doing a self-assessment against themselves. It's an outside firm um, uh, a CPA firm actually that has some specialized um, folks that can go in and perform um, a SOC 1 audit and a SOC 2 audit. A, a SOC 1 audit, and, and this goes back a, a number of years, but a SOC 1 audit, um, if you remember this thing called the SAS 70, a SOC 1 is associated with a what was known as a SAS 70, which is looking at um, internal controls and securities over financial reporting, um, uh, the types of controls, um, really we're assessing the controls over financial statement audits. Um, the, the, there is a change in the ASCPA standard. It, it used to be 
Some of you might have heard of a um, SSAE 16 SOC 1. Um, it has migrated into um, an SSAE 18 now. And the 18 um, basically gives a bit more guidance on how um, sub-service organizations need to be looked at. Sub-service organizations is, you know, um, other organizations that a provider or TPA uses that they um, uh, have uh, shared information with. And so the 18, uh, SSAE 18 helps provide some guidance on that. A SOC 2, um, again, this goes back a number of years, is associated with something called SysTrust. And um, as it relates to SysTrust, um, there is a, a pre-described, um, there are five core areas that are assessed or could be assessed as part of a SOC 2. Security has to be assessed, but then you have these other domains um, call uh, for availability, confidentiality, processing, integrity, and privacy. And so at the end of the day, you have to have security, and then you could have any uh, one or more of the other four areas. And it really depends on the organization, who you are, and what you're trying to protect. Um, in the case of our providers and in the case of, uh, of our TPAs, certainly security has to be one, as I mentioned, but privacy should be another one. And, and privacy is one of those that um, I think is, is, is certainly important. I think just from the Employee Benefit Plan audit standpoint, we're familiar with the SOC 1 reports. They're used as part of the audits. We're also discussing with clients, and clients are utilizing those SOC 1s with regard to the, um, the uh, user controls. But SOC 2 reports are not widely used yet Correct. in the industry. Correct. So I think this is this is where we need to be going forward. You heard it here first. Yeah, I think I, I do think that that SOC two is um, an important standard, and and so now the question, if, if it's in any of your minds, well, you know, is it a SOC one or a SOC two? The answer is you can have both. Um, one is more associated with financial reporting. Mm -hmm. um, the other is associated with those four domains that I mentioned. Right, and I think what's important to note is when people have been discussing cybersecurity and cyber risk, the first place people were looking to was the SOC 1 reports, and it was identified at that point that really the cyber risks are not addressed in those SOC 1 reports. There are certain IT controls that are, that are addressed, but you really need the SOC 2 to encompass the other side. So, Janet, I'm, I'm, I'm going to blow your mind now because... Oh. Yeah, th there's a new standard uh, under the SOC 2, um, and I didn't really get into it much in, in our discussion or in the slide presentation, but the ACPA came out this year in 2017 with something called um, a cybersecurity reporting framework, yep. which is an add-on to a SOC 2. Yep. And so there's additional um, specificity as it relates to cybersecurity under the SOC 2 umbrella. And the reason that I bring that up is because um, what we're seeing is there's a lot more interest in cybersecurity, obviously, because of the breaches that we've seen. And people are starting to say, well, okay, SOC 2 is great, but I want something that is, goes beyond a SOC 2 and has a, a more directed approach to cybersecurity. And so that's that cybersecurity uh, reporting it's, framework. Right. It's an overall risk framework, not just addressing specific items. Correct. Correct. Um, with both a SOC 1 and a SOC 2, just very quickly, um, there's a, a type 1 and a type 2. A type 1 is a review and, and a report, if you will, on the design of controls. It's a point in time. Um, it's what did it look like, you know, as of a particular date. Um, in my mind, a type 2 is what you want. A type 2 is not only a review of the design of the controls, but we're actually going to test the operating effectiveness of those controls over a period of time. Typically not less than a year, um, and it, most of the time it's for a, you know, a year period of time, as I indicated in the slide. Um, the type 2 audit is exactly, or is what I certainly recommend people 
ask for and look for because it actually validates in a much better way and tests the controls that they say they have in place. So um, I just wanted to share very quickly um, some of the reporting principles. I mentioned security. You can see here there's a number of key elements that get tested as part of security. And then if you go through these other areas, availability, confidentiality, processing, integrity, and privacy, you can get a better sense of the controls that need to be in place at the, you know, at the provider level, at the TSP level um, to help with all of this. Right. And as Jeff was talking about type one and type two, for, from an audit perspective, type one just identifies the procedures. So from an audit perspective, it provides no validation. The only thing that we can use from an audit perspective is the type two, which actually tests that the controls are operating and in place. Are operating effectively. Yes. Operating effectively. Great. Um, so I wanted to go on to to the cloud. And, and I know that um, I, I wanted to have you think about some uh, uh, elements of using the cloud. And, and quite frankly, I believe very strongly in the cloud. So let me just put that on the table. I think the cloud um, and most cloud providers have some great security um, around the cloud. But I, I wanted to put out there you know, or, or have you think about if there is a breach with, you know, a provider or a TSP or a, um, a TPA, sorry, um, who's responsible? Who's going to be paying the fines? Who's going to be paying for the identity theft protection? Who's going to report, and this is a big one, who's going to report it to the state? And the, the reason I bring this up is, you know, a lot of times we assume it's the other person that is holding on to the information. I think your contracts and agreements should actually state that and, and be prescriptive in what happens, who who's responsible for what. Um, and then the last point here is, does the provider or TPA have any type of cyber insurance? And, and the reason that you know, I'm bringing that up is um, it's probably not a bad idea. Um, it's important to know what is covered under the cyber insurance. Um, you know, it's not certainly your responsibility for your business um, to have you know, cyber insurance, although certainly many businesses are starting to think mm -hmm. about getting their own cyber insurance. So um, food for thought, I just wanted to put it out there for, for folks to think about. Um, from a business perspective, I think one of the areas that you really need to think about is the inventory that you have that you store on site on premise. So what kind of PI do you actually store? Where is it located and how is it protected? Um, and, and equally important, who has access to it? I think clearly we need to put policies, procedures and protocols in place and they should be documented to um, control and monitor who has access to the sensitive information um, and, and validate how we're going to protect it. The other thing I want to point out here is if you have outside vendors who have access to your network, and that could be a, some type of network service provider, um, they should be constrained as to what they have access to as well. And that should be part of your overall cybersecurity program. Um, just so that everyone is aware, why are these cyber attacks happening? Um, the, the, in the case of uh, Equifax and in a number of other cases, um, there was a lack of patching or updating software on various systems. Um, there has also been a lack of, of use of complex passwords. And we'll get into a little bit more of a discussion on that in, in a little bit. Um, virus protection that was missing from computers or hasn't been updated on computers. Um, backups. Backups are really important if you ever get ransomware because instead of paying the ransom, if you know that your backup is good, you can restore from it. Ultimately, there's a big chunk um, of these attacks that are happening because of people. Um, and it's not because people are um, giving out information. Um, they're inadvertent actors. They're, 
they're well-meaning employees, but mistakenly um, allowed an attacker to get into their system, um, allowed an attacker um, via a phishing exercise or even a phone, you know, calling someone up on the phone as the IT department. You know, they, they failed to pay attention to um, good security practices and eventually um, gave up uh, confidential information or their own, you know, user ID and password. Um, social engineering is still a big threat and, and something we need to be um, very careful about. Um, so how do employees fit in? Well, they can be your, your, your biggest liability or your best asset. Um, they can connect infected devices to your network that could expose your network, you know, to attackers. Um, they can, um, uh, uh, on a phishing exercise, um, uh, they can actually provide information to the attackers. They can browse suspicious sites. Um, they can, as identified in here, click on bad emails. Um, that's when they're a liability. When they're an asset, they're your first line of defense. They can identify incidents. They can um, talk to others and be that influencer to say, boy, this doesn't make sense. Let's find out. Let's get more information. And they can be your best security program as long as they know what it means to be an asset um, from a security perspective. Training, training, training. So some of the threats, um, as you can see here, you know, we've got, you know, infiltrating the software attacks. Key loggers are pieces of software that, like a ransomware, get downloaded to your PC and um, essentially will track all keystrokes, um, user IDs and passwords, any sites that you go to, and it will bundle up a package and send it out on the Internet. The social engineering, I think we talked about phishing, um, spear phishing, it's when it's a directed. Um, I won't go into skimming much, but certainly we've seen and heard a lot about using um, ATMs or other um, credit card or bank card um, uh, devices. Um, I will share with you that I strongly urge you, and a, a bit off topic, but do not use your bank card um, at uh, gas stations or other POS terminals, and, and I suggest that only because um, they can get your account information and they can go in and take out, you know, money. And although most of the time you will get it back if you can prove to the bank, you know, that there was an issue, they've already, the money's already taken out, so you don't have access to it, and it might take months to get. Safer to use a credit card. Safer, much safer to use a credit card. And then lastly, we have hacking. Um, I did want to just spend a few minutes um, on on phishing and spear phishing. Um, we've got all these other new terms out there: smishing, you know, for for texting. I don't and vishing for phone. It's it, we just need to understand we are under attack, and you know, certainly phishing is an area that we need to be um, concerned about. Um, a phishing email contains links. A lot of times you're going to see per, per grammar or spelling. Um, there's typically a sense of urgency um, or a threat or reward. What I'd like to do is just share with you a couple. These are real life emails. You'll see here that um, that uh, it, it really isn't an Amazon email. It, it looks like one, but it really isn't um, a very generic. So this is not a spear phishing exercise. This is just a phishing exercise because it says dear client and I'll show you spear phishing in a minute um, and then the last thing I want to point out is there's a link there it looks like an Amazon link but when you hover over it it's a, a non Amazon site and and if you hover your mouse over an attachment you, you typically will get um, where, what that site looks like another one from PayPal um, spelling errors, you know, it, it's just, you can typically, if you spend a bit of time looking at an email, tell, are they asking, are they putting me in an awkward situation? Are they asking me for confidential information? And I'm going to say 99.99999% of the time, um, you, you shouldn't uh, click on any links or 
um, access or respond to any of these uh, uh, types of emails. What I think is important too, as Jeff mentioned, all the different ways. One of the newer technologies also is there's an app for everything. There's an app for that, including now we're seeing apps for um, your retirement accounts um, and accessing them. So it's not only um, accessing information through the business and through the plans, through the um, TPA or custodian, but now you have access through your phone, through your apps where you're accessing your retirement account. So it's just another area or vehicle for attacks to happen. Absolutely. Um, attachments. Um, if I don't know who an email is coming from, I will never click on an attachment. And I'd like you to think about that as well. Um, attachments typically are bad news, um, particularly if you don't know who it's coming from. So attach, be very careful with attachments. Um, we've heard a lot about, you know, ACH and uh, transferring money. Um, if you're using ACH or plan on using ACH, you should have some pretty strong protocols in place to make sure and validate that, particularly if someone wants to change anything in an ACH like routing numbers, that you have controls in place to validate and make sure um, that there are controls to work with the actual company. And, and for me, that tends to suggest we're going to pick up the phone. We're not just going to um, deal with this in an email or electronically. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pick up the phone and, and call the business and make sure that you have the real business number, not a number that someone provided in an email. Right. And I think that's an important thing to note. Anytime anything changes with regard to transmissions, you should use a different vehicle to validate that it's accurate. Um, so I'm going to move on to ransomware. This is actually a ransomware uh, crypto locker. Um, it, it's a little bit dated, but the screen pretty much says it all. Uh, ransomware encrypts not only your the information on your PC, but it actually goes out to any network drives that you have access to and will encrypt it um, and, and that information. Um, and so this is what the screen is telling me is that we've been – you know, hit by crypto locker, which is ransomware. Um, they're going to give us access as long as we pay for it to the private key to unencrypt the information. They're giving us a date and they're also telling us we've got 95 hours left. And so if we don't respond within that time, um, we're going to, we won't be able to get the encryption key. A lot of times um, when I'm giving, you know, on, on site presentations, a question comes up. And the question is, well, how do we know that we're going to get the encryption key um, if we pay the ransom? Um, I'm going to say 99.99% of the time you will. And the reason is if there's an understanding that you don't get, you know, the key, um, people won't be paying the ransom. And I know I don't know of any ransom that has been paid that a key hasn't been provided. Mm -hmm. um, so they're they're pretty good about getting you the key once you pay the ransom. Ransom, of course, is paid in, in um, bitcoins, which is untraceable. Um, you know, we, we've had clients who have had ransomware. Um, one client in particular had three instances of ransomware. And quite frankly, it, it occurred because of bad network security protocols. Um, it also was an issue of people. People were clicking on links and um, ultimately they were infecting themselves um, with ransomware. And so ransomware can be a very malicious tool and, and something that, you know, you, you got to be careful of. And I actually had a client recently who shared that they tested their employees and over 60 percent of their employees failed the test because they were doing internal tests to see if people would click yep. on the malicious software. And, and so that went back to, they went back and they're enhancing their training and protocols at that organization. Absolutely. And, and I mentioned earlier, training, 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 Janet. I can't tell you how important training is, not just once a year or once while a person is at the firm, but it needs to be an ongoing program. Mm -hmm. Um, I mentioned I talked about passwords. Um, if your password is on this list, um, you don't have a good password. And so um, 
these are passwords you, you certainly want to stay away from. Um, I have changed my stance on passwords. Um, before, you know, we wanted to have uh, a, a shorter turnaround time for getting new passwords. Um, you know, we used to recommend 30, probably more like 60 days of, of getting a new password. From my perspective, um, we need to change that thought process and, and go from and, and go to a much longer password. And I would say a minimum of 12 characters. And I think the screen suggests why. Um, and it also should be complex. So um, and thus you can move it from, um, you know, a 30 to 60 day, certainly to a 90 or 180 day password rotation. Um, I, I certainly um, think that it's important to have a longer password. And, you know, again, it shouldn't be words in a dictionary. I do still believe it should be complex, which includes upper and lower case letters, numbers, and special characters. Um, some tips, uh, you know, I have a term, although it's not exactly this, but my password, I have a term that I use and um, it gives me, you know, a, a number of different options. It's upper and lower case. It's not the 12 characters that I mentioned earlier, but I'm going to get there. Um, and, and actually mine currently is about 15 characters. Um, there's a lot of um, two-factor authentication questions that are we're now seeing. Um, you know, what's your, your your pet's name? You know, where'd you go to high school? So on and so forth. And and quite frankly, a lot of that information is on the internet, and and people mm -hmm. can guess it. Um, pets' names. You know, look at Facebook. You can pretty much tell what <laughs> your current pet is. And and adding a little bit more flavor to that, sometimes. You know, I have a couple of pets or one, I, I've had three dogs in the past couple of years, you know, which one did I put in? And, and mm -hmm. where I'm going with this is for these um, challenge security questions, what you might want to consider is using one standard term. It's not being checked on a pet name or color or what high school, right? And I put here blue jumping jacks. Well, that's a term that I could use for any question and it makes it easier for me. It makes it harder for anyone else who's trying to get what that security questions or what those security questions are. Um, Janet mentioned earlier about the the um, need and and for mobile apps. We need them. We use them. We just need to be very careful about them. And I think part of that also is where are we using our mobile apps mm -hmm. and where are, are we using you know um, someone's wireless services so i'm going to use an example here of starbucks and there's nothing wrong with starbucks in any way shape or form but they in some instances have unsecured um, wireless for our use um, if i'm the bad guy i can actually sit on the network from inside the building or outside the building and i can look at packets of information and if you're accessing um through an app um protected information or you're going out to someone's site please be very careful because there are folks out there that can track that information and do some um, assessment on it and potentially use it um, to your detriment. And a best practice would be not to access your retirement plan apps or your banking apps or anything like that unless you're in a secured network situation. Absolutely. So we're we're coming down to the home stretch here. Um, just some best practices that I wanted to share with you. Um, cybersecurity is not just an IT issue. It's um, It starts at the top, the tone at the top, you know, with um, the businesses, either CIO, um, uh, board members, certainly, um, it, it is something that we all need to be aware of. Um, I do believe, and we, we talked about cybersecurity um, and the SOC 1, SOC 2, um, one of the things you might want to consider is at the very least having a cybersecurity risk assessment performed which will identify, are there any gaping holes within your overall 
um, environment? And if so, what's the best ways to, to patch those holes, if you will? Um, I, I do believe in, in changing or enforcing regular password changes, but I think here, if you add length to your password to 12 or 15 characters, this slide could be changed to 90 to 180 days, right? Um, and if you have the ability for two-factor authentication, absolutely, you know, um, consider it. Um, make sure that you have backup and recovery processes that are tested in place. Um, I can't tell you the number of times that I've been in an organization where it hasn't been fully tested. And thus, when they go to do a restore, they're surprised that either some of the information is not restorable or, and it's happened to a number of clients, they never were backing up that information. So food for thought. Um, antivirus and spyware, you know, we all have it on our computers, but when was the last time we validated um, when it was updated and the, the latest and greatest virus um, signatures put on the PC? I bring that up because when we do our vulnerability um, security assessments, it's certainly one thing that we look at. Um, I would tell you that 80% um, of the time we find at least one computer that doesn't have, it does have antivirus, but it doesn't have the most up-to-date um, antivirus on it. We talked a little bit about the wireless network. Really be careful, you know, what networks you, you get onto from a wireless perspective. Um, policies and procedures are, are important. I want to skip down to the last two bullets here. Encrypt all laptops and removable devices. Um, if you have a laptop, it should be encrypted. Um, if you're using Windows Professional or Windows um, Enterprise on the PC level, you already have um, encryption software called BitLocker. If you're using a Mac, Macs already come with encryption software. So please use them um, if at all possible. I don't know if we've hammered home training enough yet, Janet, but <laughs> certainly um, training people is really important as it relates to cybersecurity. All right, so now what are the best practices regarding the benefit plan? Um, I, I do believe you take a look at, you know, have, have you performed uh, a cyber risk assessment on your operations and also you know, do you have an insurance policy, you know, that covers the, the plan activity? One of the things I, I do want to share with you is, as it relates to the insurance policy is a lot of times the insurance carrier will provide you um, with a self-assessment questionnaire that says, how are you, what are your security protocols? Be very careful and make sure you answer it honestly, because there have been certainly um, a number of actual um uh, legal cases that if you're not honest on that self-assessment, um, you can get yourself into trouble and the, the policy won't cover it. Um, does your provider or TPA, you know, what are their security protocols? Do they have a SOC 1 and or a SOC 2 as we discussed before? Um, some of them do, some of them don't, but those are questions we should be asking them because they have our information if I was a business, and we want to make sure we can protect our information as best as we can. And then one of the things we talk about also in our audits is reviewing those SOC 1 reports to, um, with regard to the user controls and making sure you have those user controls in place because it's together that those work to protect your plan and your plan operations. So. Also make sure that if you're going to be sending any type of um, personal information that you're sending it either encrypted um, or through a secured email and portal. And quite frankly, I would recommend a secure portal. Um, I, I, I Sometimes email is, is not the appropriate um, uh, way to, to send um, confidential or, or PI related information. Um, I think lastly, in, in these last two bullet points, really, um, to some extent, go hand in hand. Um, there should be a plan. There should be um, 
a plan in place um, related to cybersecurity and security as a whole as to how you're protecting information and um, securing that information the best way possible. Um, those plans should um, be reviewed at least on an annual basis, if not on a semi-annual basis, because at the end of the day, quite frankly, um, things change so frequently. So with that, Janet and, and the rest of the group, um, thank you very much for, for spending the, the last hour with us. I hope it was informative and provided you with some guidance and um, some thoughts on how to improve um, security protocols and practices within your organization and the types of questions to ask the providers and TPAs. We'll go through any questions we might have right now. So I have one here, Jeff. You discussed the SOC 1 and SOC 2 reports. What should we ask for if our vendor doesn't have either of these? Um, I, I would ask why you don't have it, mm -hmm. right? And, and certainly we can, and I've seen a lot of customer pressure to get them. Mm -hmm. But at the very least, um, we can certainly um, ask if they've had some type of independent security assessment performed. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you, you can certainly ask or see if that you can get a copy of it. Um, what I've seen other organizations do is that um, the business um, or organization will provide the TPA in particular with, um, I'll call it a, a security survey. Mm -hmm. and, and the TPA will fill it out to the best of their ability, and that will be the basis to confirm the type of security um, um, provided by that organization. Okay. Um, not that we haven't hit on this enough, but people are the weakest link. What are the important steps we should be taking with our employees? It, it's For very training. simple. It's training. Okay. Um, training on what to do if they see a phishing exercise um, or if they're concerned that they are being fished, mm -hmm. um, if they're being asked for confidential information, I would tell you, pick up the phone and call the person and just make sure they're really asking um, and requesting that information. Um, ask yourself if an employee found a, a thumb drive on the floor, are they trained to um, hand it over to IT or throw it in the, the um, trash can, or would they plug it into their computer? If they're going to hand it over to IT or throw it in the trash, that's the right response. I think many of us have the curiosity factor of, hey, I wonder what's on this, and, and that only gets us in trouble. Thank you very much for attending with us today. Um, please feel free to contact us if you have any questions. We have a variety of resources on our website and in our newsletters. There's also, as Jeff, as Jeff had mentioned, AICPA resources as well as DOL resources. Remember, you can't prevent, but you can protect.